Now, while U.S. stocks have gained this year, now may be a good time to look overseas if you ask Brett, Brett Gallagher. He's Deputy Chief Investment Officer at Arterio Global Management. That company, by the way, has $57 billion in assets under management, and its global high-income fund is in the top 7% of its class over the last five years. So good to see you. Good to have you hey, back. Good to see it's been you. been a little Thank while. Um, what is the backdrop here? I mean, we're seeing some selling not only here in the U.S., but around the globe today. Obviously, news out of Japan uh, caused some nervousness, but... Is the global backdrop a bad one at this point for, for stocks, or is it an okay one? Well, I think it's an okay one. You, uh, on, the, on the plus side, you've got a fairly good liquidity situation, the Fed continuing their quantitative easing at least through the end of June. The Japanese going to have to rebuild their economy from, mm -hmm. the, from the tragedy, probably also engaging in a sort of quantitative easing. Uh, policy. On the other hand, you've got some big unknowns out there. You've you've got the the end of quantitative easing. How do we reduce the Fed's balance sheet? You've got the the debt problems in Europe, and you've got huge debt issues in much of the developed world. Brett, you help manage what about 57 billion dollars in assets? I mean, I'm curious. We we talk so much about the end of QE2. How do you guys start to factor that in? I mean, are there economic models, mathematical models, models that you can say when we take off QE2, to take off that stimulus, what it's going to mean potentially? for the equity markets for the trade? Well, this one is interesting because we, we've never been here before. Uh, what the Fed has been doing over the past couple of years has been unprecedented. Mm. Uh, the size of the Fed's balance sheet. There's no model built here there, for this There's one? no model built for it. So I think you, you really have to um, you, you really have to put, put together a, a series of, of what ifs. And the support, the, the quantitative easing that's been done so far has worked in terms of keeping equity prices aloft. When you, when you pull it back, I do think equities are probably going to find it a little bit more difficult. Right. But in relation to other asset classes, would I rather own a fixed in income instrument yielding next to nothing? Probably not. Probably not. So the equity trade still makes sense. Yeah. So, Brett, I mean, what is more important? Is it just all the moves by the Fed, all the stimulus? That's what keeps the equity markets going. That's what keep really kind of all the moves in the asset classes going. Well, I think as long as equities are trading within a fair range, I, I wouldn't try to make the case that equities are excessively expensive. I do think the long-term return from equities is going to be below what we have been used to historically, more in the neighborhood of perhaps five to six, six and a half percent. Mm. Um, you know, in an environment like that, maybe you, you want stocks with, with higher yields. You're already getting closer to that, to that number. Um, but longer term, you'd really have to look for where is growth going to come through. Try to focus on the long term underlying secular trends, not the, the near term tactical and moves. You know, we here at Bloomberg, we love to look at these the trends and where growth is coming from. Adam, I want to bring you into this because one indicator um, that shows that U.S. expansion could actually be picking up steam. Talk to me about this. Yeah, well, talk about picking up steam, right? We're talking rail car loadings. In other words, just how many cars are being loaded with stuff? And there you have it. We're practically back up to where we were three years ago, Carol. This is really key because this number is, is coal, it's metal, it's all kinds of parts, it's auto parts. It's really everything that keeps this economy humming. So, uh, Brett, I guess the question goes out to you. If, in fact, we've got car loadings that are up practically to where they were before the market sold off, when the economy was really humming, does that give you any more confidence in, in what's happening? Well, I, I think it helps. It, it, it's providing a little level of support. We are seeing some pickup economically. Um, employment growth has, has picked up nicely. This is just another bit of data. But the real question is, it, it's when the Fed steps back, can that baton be handed off and this, this rally or this recovery remain intact? I, I think that's where the, the real question is. I asked you earlier about, you know, do you guys have any models that you're setting up for when QE2 ends? I mean, what, what are the scenarios that you're expecting? What is the scenario you're expecting when the Fed steps off all of its uh, extraordinary stimulus measures? Well, I think you, I'm not looking for a deep market term, but I do think that the, the rally will certainly slow and perhaps we'll, we'll see a market that is flattens out. Is it more psyche out. than fundamentals there at that point? Um, I, I think it probably is. Um, what we then have to see is what will the Fed do? Are they going to try for a QE3? I don't think that's going to be the immediate case. Mm. Do they simply use the maturities that they have now and buy new instruments sort of maintaining the size of the balance sheet? That might be a little more likely. I want to talk strategy for, with you for in, in, in just a moment, but I want to bring in Sheila because, Sheila, you're looking specifically at the emerging markets. They've been on a roll, but not necessarily today, that's for sure. That's right. A rough day for emerging markets. You know, the MSCI Emerging Markets Index down about 2% today. That is the biggest intraday drop we've seen since March. So certainly a big decline and, you know, really a different point of view of what we're seeing today, of what we have seen in the past. You know, at, you know, just before today, emerging markets were actually at a 34-month high. You know, fund flows into a lot of these countries 
were just kept on going. China, South Korea among some of the big of them. Brett, my question to you is, are we starting to see a different tone when it comes to the emerging markets? You know, you had that Goldman call today about commodities. You had Morgan Stanley make some comments about emerging market earnings. Is there a different tilt happening towards those economies right now? Well, there is an ebb and flow in emerging markets. We did see in December, January, February, because of the inflation scares around the world, emerging markets underperformed developed markets. I think what that period really did was chase out some of the, uh, the, the performance chasers who piled into emerging markets just because they were performing. Not a bad thing, necessarily. Um, well, <laughs> it, it, it helps set the table for, for more sustainable growth down the road. Uh, going forward, though, the, the real key is simply the number of emerging middle class consumers around the world. The UN estimates we've got two and a half billion middle class consumers today going to four billion in the next 10 years. Most of that, India, China. Uh, that means there are going to be a lot more people with discretionary spending, and, and that's going to really be key in terms of stock selection. Brett, we've forward. been chasing that, though, for a long time, that emerging middle class in countries mm -hmm. such as India and China. China. It, but it picks up an awful lot of speed, is what you're saying, then over the next few years? Because I feel like I've heard this story for a long time, that we yeah. want that uh, middle class in those developing countries, but it's taking a while. I mean, you've got folks who can't even get clean water, so it's going to take a long time to get that middle class developed. Right. Well, the numbers are huge. I mean, you're, you're talking a billion and a half people in China, a billion right. plus in India, 900 million in Africa. We're not talking about that entire number moving, moving into a middle class, but even if you get a portion of it, the numbers are just huge. You, you know, you, you've got 300 million people here in the U.S., 300 million in China is only 20 percent of the total. So you're going to begin seeing uh, people buying household products that don't today, spending money on education that don't today, mm. spending money on pharmaceuticals that don't or can't today. So in terms of, I'm just looking at your strategy, I mean, you've got about, what, 20 percent in the emerging market, 4 percent exposure to Japan, and 32 percent exposure to Europe. Is that an overweight for Europe at this point? Is that unusual for you guys? Um, it, it's not unusual. And a lot of the European companies that we, that we are buying do business outside of Europe. It, it's not the domestic European plays that we're making so much. So it's companies that are selling into some of these emerging markets, for example, luxury goods companies, mm -hmm. uh, automakers. Uh, the, the war, it's really a global play today. And to divide the world, emerging, developed, sometimes is a little bit of a, a misnomer. There's a lot of gray area, isn't there? A lot of gray area. <laughs> Yeah. Brett, good to have you back on Street Smart. Thank you so That's much. Been fun. Thank you. Brett Gallagher.